Well, hello. Welcome to Getting Started in Strategic Planning. Uh, this is Chris DeCenso with Growth Strategy Partners. I have my partner, Paul Plotzik, on the line. Paul, Paul, you there? Yes, I am. Hello, folks. Welcome. All right. Today, um, we're going to explain how to get started in strategic planning, and it's going to be very fast-paced. So we're going to go through actually a lot of content um, and give you a lot of information of if you want to get started in strategic planning, how would you do that? So that's just the pace of it. But again, uh, at the end, if it will be recorded. So if you want to copy the presentation uh, or watch it again, you'll, you'll get a copy of the presentation and you can go see it online. Uh, give you a little background on who's in the audience today. 60% uh, of you are presidents, CEOs, or managing directors. That, that ownership title, and 40% are GMs, national sales managers, directors of some sort, and some VPs. Uh, about 65% are manufacturer distribution, so product-based, and 35% is service-based. So that's the audience that we have today. So let's jump in. Um, here's a question. So if you were to go ask some of the key people, the key leaders in your business, these questions, my question to you is, would you get the same answers back? Simple things like, what are the top three goals we're working towards? Or what projects are we working on to accomplish these goals? Why do our customers buy from us? And, and a few others here. And these are just a, a limited set of questions that you, know, you think you would hope everybody in your organization, if not the key people, will be able to answer uh, in a similar fashion, if not with the exact same answers. Well, the point of this is that when we work with organizations uh, that don't have plans of any sort and we ask these questions, we do not get similar answers. And what does that do for the business? The, the team is not aligned, the organization is not aligned, and effectively it's not working as well or efficient or as profitable as it could be. Okay. So that's kind of the point of what we want to address today. How we're going to do that is tell you about what is strategic planning. Why should I do it? And then how do I do it? And really get to the how with some, some details and some meat as best as we can. Tell you a little about our presenters. So I'm the good looking guy on the left. Uh, you can see a little bit about my background. We got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of background in industry and then also in consulting. Uh, probably the last 10 years uh, plus has been focused on growth and how do you grow a business with a specific focus really on strategy and, and how do you build a plan and how do you execute the plan? The, uh, the comment at the bottom there, one down, one to go, really refers to my two kids. One's graduated from college, <laughs> and she's out of the house, and the second one's still here, ready to go. Paul, how about you? So, so, so you hope, right, that the other one's ready to I, go? I still have one more. I still have, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I still go to work, as they say. Right, right. Oh, folks, um, as you can see, I've got, you know, 30-plus years of, uh, of experience. And I've spent uh, quite a bit of time running businesses. I actually worked for uh, the U.S. Justice Department some years ago. I was at, uh, appointed as a, to work for the trustee of Northeast, um, Northeast United States. So I've run a number of businesses on a short-term turnaround basis. I've also run a couple of companies for a longer period of time. And then went into consulting some years ago. And I've focused on businesses from a couple of different perspectives. One of very large corporations, as you can see there, I've, I've identified a few. One is the, is I've worked, done some work for the government, done some work for NASA and Department of Defense. Also in the EPC industry, I've done work for a lot of uh, different size companies, most notably AECOM, which uh, helped grow and was part of the growth as they grew from a $400 million organization to today. I think there's someplace around $60 billion. And have focused uh, over the past couple of years on, on uh, smaller enterprises, primarily family-owned businesses that are, are, are typically under a billion dollars in annual revenues. Um, and I've written a couple of books. I've done a lot of blogging. At the end of this, also, we'll offer you a couple of articles uh, that, I've, that I've written. In fact, we'll, we'll, we'll um, just figure out which ones to send to you and, and uh, get them over to you uh, so you can see the, some of the work that I've done. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Paul and I are two of the five uh, partners at Growth Strategy Partners. Uh, you see here, we, we basically work with uh, privately held organizations. We help them improve their performance, their revenue growth, their profit growth, and the, the growth of their, of their team 
by implementing our seven keys to growth, which is what we've identified drives long-term growth based on some research we've done with over 600 plus CEOs. One of the keys to growth, as you see at the top here, is effective growth planning is what we call it, but it's, it's strategic planning. Strategic planning is that, is that piece of it. And that's, again, what we're going to talk about today. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the things that we've done that we're very successful, very happy about, actually, is one client just recently uh, involving with strategic planning, uh, but their focus was on, was on growth. We helped uh, grow that business, uh, the, the value of that business, five times over two years um, by doing a lot of, actually, a lot of these seven keys. So, again, we focus a lot on implementation. What I want to do uh, to get a little understanding of the audience today is ask you a question. We've got a, uh, a poll that you should be seeing uh, on, your, on your screen and I'd like you to, to answer the question, you know, what has been the biggest challenge you've had in developing a strategic plan? And so I'd like you to, to click on an answer to the extent that just I don't believe we ever needed one. Uh, we can't find the time to develop one, not sure how to, how to build one. Uh, I don't think I'm large enough. Uh, to build one, or, you know, we actually already have one. I'm just looking to learn more, which is always a, a thing we like to see here. So if everyone would click through on that, I can actually see the votes coming through. I see over half is done right now. Um, and we'll let you, uh, everyone see this, so I'll close it in a, in a, in a few, eh, 20 seconds or so, and then I'll share with everybody here what we have. And, uh, Paul, you can see the same thing and tell us what we look at. All right, I'm going to uh, we got almost 90% here done, so this is good. So I'm going to close this up and, uh, in fact, uh, share it with you. And all right, Paul, you should be able to see that now. And what, yeah. what, I, what you see yeah. actually is 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 50%. Uh, I already have one. They're yeah, looking to learn more, which mm -hmm. is which is actually great. Congratulations, that's uh, nice. Yeah. Then uh, the next one is 25%, not sure how to build one, which is good because that's why we're having the webinar. We actually get, again, mm -hmm. a lot of um, comments from owners and presidents, and I just don't know how to build one. Um, I do like the fact that zero says they don't believe they it's not needed. So that's good, actually. Probably keep mm -hmm. that in mind as we go through this and uh, maybe not worry as much about convincing them they need it, but getting into how do we do it. Anything you want to add on that, Paul? Well, the companies that already have a strategic plan, we're hoping that what we'll be able to do is to, is to share with you some tools and techniques of how to perhaps make your, your plan more articulate um, for the rest of your organization or just some ideas to help you, um, you know, do some different things with your strategic plan. We hope that's of value to you. And the ones, of course, building point. it, we're going to give you, you know, we'll give you the four, four steps that, that we talk about and that we use with our clients. Perfect. All right. So, uh, back to the show. So, before we get into strategic planning and the planning itself, good quote from Steve Case, AOL, um, you know, it's about execution. So, you, we can put a plan together all day, but we have to keep in mind it's about execution. This is the big picture. You can plan all day, but it's those that, it, that are better at execution and implementation of that plan are the ones that actually can be successful long term. And we'll get into that also a little later today. So let's start with what is strategic planning? Paul, what's strategic planning? Well, this fits with the last uh, slide we just went over, folks. And really the way we look at strategic planning is, it, is really, it, it's really about making choices. In an organization, you know, as we were preparing for this seminar, one of the things we talked about together is that all the organizations that we work with, they have a plan. Sometimes it's not articulated, and we know that there's a plan because there's, there's activity happening in the organization, all directed towards the accomplishment of some goals, and the goals are serving some purpose. So we look at a strategic plan as, you know, that you're making choices and it helps you make choices because there are trade-offs in the operation of an enterprise. And what the way we, we talk about it and try to define it is we say, it's a unique and valuable position that you're creating, and it's different from your competitors. It's a, a deliberate choice that you're making um, to be different. Um, and a way that we look at the process, because that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about here, is the process of building a strategic plan, is that it really is an alignment exercise. It's a way to get people focused. It's a way to get the whole organization 
headed generally in the same direction with an understanding of what it is that they're looking to accomplish. And what you'll hear us talk about is that companies that don't have a strategic plan, they have a tendency to, to, to almost look like they're a little bit lost in the forest. That is, without a strategic plan, they have a tendency to, to move into areas that perhaps they shouldn't be into. So a strategic plan helps you get focused, helps you get focused on a direction. You know, and I'll emphasize the two words that I like to talk about, Paul mentioned, was alignment um, mm -hmm. and process. Uh, as a process engineer, as an engineer, you know, I'm, I'm always process oriented. And it's about a process. So, you know, what strategic planning isn't, you know, Paul talked about goals. And companies may have goals or things they're working on. Uh, management by walking around this MW, uh, MBWA, you know, that's not strategic planning. With, a, with an owner saying, well, I've got it all up in my head, so I just walk around and tell people what to do. There may be goals and action, but it's not a process of aligning the team and the organization. And for those that said they already have a plan, they want to know if the one gets better, if it's a document that sits on a shelf, that's, that might be a plan, but let's emphasize mm -hmm. the process piece. It's a planning process. Putting a plan in place and then and basically putting it on the shelf or not applying it or implementing it, it's really not a plan. We've, uh, we'll do some surveys, Paul. You know, we go out and do these uh, assessments, uh, growth assessments on business, and we ask, we do a, a pre-survey uh, uh, a quantified survey asking them, do you have a plan, how good's the plan, et cetera, et cetera. We usually get good scores, whether we've got a plan, it's very robust, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we go and do interviews and we ask them, you know, well, how often do you re review the plan? And they're like, well, we kind of don't. And I said, well, mm -hmm. what, what are the goals? And we get different answers on what the goals are. So although they've gone through with putting a document together, they're not aligned on what it takes to grow and, 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 and we differentiate the business. And we've also heard from a lot of people about the balanced scorecard, and we really like the balanced scorecard. But what we know about the balanced scorecard is that it's, it's primarily a communications tool in the enterprise, and it's a way to help you understand what are the critical pieces that need to get done in an organization and, and, and how to essentially um, articulate and make those visible to, to the whole enterprise. So these, that's a tool to help ensure that this unique and valuable position that you put into the marketplace produces a profit, and that's primarily its goal. So let's go through, Paul. We've got some we've got some uh, slides on on why plan, but a lot of the people here didn't answer that they didn't believe it was needed. So we'll go through this mm -hmm. real quickly. You know, we got some facts. Uh, the companies that plan are, are larger and, and more profitable. I love the Bain survey uh, talks about that. Their, and this is large companies, their biggest challenge in achieving their goals was that they failed to develop a good strategy and then make decisions and execute well. So again, back to not just having a plan or a strategy, but making decisions and executing those decisions. So again, those that have it, the plan, how well are you executing that plan? Um, these are some of the you know reasons or excuses I guess we've heard in the past as to why companies don't have plans, I don't think we need to get into them. We don't have people that don't think it's needed. So I'm just going to jump right through this, Paul, and let's talk about, you know, how we do it. Okay? All right. Well, so, you know, and back to one of the positions we talked about before that I want to, you know, kind of underscore before we get into how do you in building a team and, the, and how important that is. We talked about, you know, a, a strategy is about helping you, um, you know, make choices about what some of the trade-offs are. And so really what we talk about is a strategy. I, there's two kind of critical pieces that determine success in a strategy. That is where to play. So that's who your, your customers are. What are you, who are your target customers and where are they? And the other is how to win. You know, how do you create a compelling value proposition? And to put this together, um, it, we believe that you need to put together um, – you need to bring a team together of your best and brightest. One of the things we hear from a lot of companies when we talk about getting a focus on a strategic planning process is they seem to want to put people um, you know, into the process who maybe don't necessarily have a lot to do at the current time. And what we suggest to them is we really want the people who really understand your enterprise very well, your best contributors. And this sends a couple of messages throughout the organization. And one of the critical messages that it sends is that 
ownership, the executives are really serious about this process. And also, it helps to make sure that the, um, the, the position that's taken, the suggestions that are taken are not discounted or explained away. One of the things that was mentioned to a, a fellow we were talking about just a few weeks ago in preparation for the seminar is that to bring in people who are a little bit, as he put it, out of the box. We did an article back some time ago called How to, how to, how to Grow an Organizational Deviant, and it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek title. But really what we're talking about is how do you get these are people in your organization that are sometimes a little bit annoying, but they have a tendency to look at the organization in a very different way than everybody else. So maybe that's some of the kinds of people that you might want to put on this team. Your out of the box thinkers, maybe not the ones that are so far out of the box that they're that they're considered to be kind of organizational deviants, but people who see things a little differently. So when you build, and this is a good point, a couple of things, Paul. You talked about you know making choices. Uh, so again, does the plan help you define your customers and define the choices of which customers you go after? We've got a client mm -hmm. now we're working with, and they're they're struggling with. Uh, uh, there's four actually four partners, and they're trying to figure out which markets to go after, and each the four of them want to do something differently. Um, so again, if, if we're walking them through that process to help them figure out what's best for the business, you know, in addition to what's best for them. Right. But from a right. team perspective, you know, so everyone always defaults to the executive team, leadership team, staff, whatever you want to call it, um, which again typically would be included. The thing we'd like to add here is that if you're building a plan you think that your future is going to involve technology, let's say, or some use of technology. Mm -hmm. And the head of technology is not a senior position but may report to the CFO or something like that. Include them in the process. They've got the, the detailed mm -hmm. technology knowledge. Uh, or product development may not be on the, the top tier or somebody might be a, a, la a layer down. Let's bring in that knowledge set. So it's not just about the titles. It's about the knowledge and that's the key thing in building mm -hmm. this team not only being leaders uh, but somebody that brings knowledge to the picture mm -hmm. the other thing that uh, we get asked often is well do you use a facilitator or you don't don't use a facilitator um, and you know it's somewhat a, a yes and no any anyone doing something new strategic planning the first time we definitely encourage uh, a facilitator for for a couple reasons um, one is the process of building a strategic plan isn't something you'd necessarily go out, read a book, and know how to do it. Uh, there's some expertise behind it. There's technique behind it. There's tools behind it. So if you're trying to embark on something the first time, whether it be strategy or search engine optimization or a new you know, CRM tool or anything like that, we advise bringing in an expert that can help guide you. Um, if you already have a plan or have put one together, then it, there's there's reasons why you would or would not use a facilitator. If mm -hmm. and usually the reasons why you you would not need a facilitator is if the person leading it internally within your team could be the president or could be somebody else, but is a great facilitator, brings in the opinions from all those involved in the team, um, and knows the process. So we have a lot of mm -hmm. clients where we've done a lot of operational work and sales improvement work, but they don't need us for strategy because they've got someone on site that's done it before. At the same time, we've had clients where the president had done the strategic planning before, knows the process, but wanted a third, uh, an outsider's perspective, and didn't, he didn't want to mm -hmm. be the person leading and guiding decision-making. He kind of knew he was a little uh, domineering and therefore said, yep, we want to bring an outsider. So there's pros and cons to a facility, and you know, that's something you should think about as you start building your team. Can you do it yourself, or do you need help? Okay. Also, what we found is that there, one of the reasons that people um, have difficulty getting to, or organizations have difficulty getting into strategic planning, is that it fits outside kind of the skill set of a lot of people who are in leadership positions. And part of the reason it does is because it's a bit of a fuzzy discipline. And people in executive positions frequently want to get things right and have things be perfect. And developing a strategy, as, as you're saying, Chris, you know, especially in the early stages or where you haven't done it before, it's, it's not going to be a perfect process. It's, it, and, it, and it essentially makes people uncomfortable because one of the things it does is you're creating possibility, uh, you know, in an uncertain and unknown future. And if you're an executive 
typically you're, you may be the kind of person who um, makes declarations and knows that you can make very, you know, really good decisions. But in, in a strategy development process, you're in an area where you're creating possibility. You're in an area that's that's uh, where you're confronting a future that you can only guess at. And so that's a little well, bit un of an uncomfortable situation. Sometimes it's useful to get somebody who who can help lead the group through that, and, and so you can participate. Don't don't forget you're talking to an engineer, and this is a science, right? I mean, it's <laughs> nebulous, but it's a science. Just keep that in mind, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's let's talk about how we do this, okay? So how do you how do you build a strategic plan? We've got our map, as we call it. Um, and it's broken down into four phases. Let's assess what's going on. You know, where are we now? Okay. Envision the future. Where do we want to be? Start defining where, where we want to be, how we're going to And then the fourth phase is reviewing the process. So, again, going to emphasize a lot about process and review. So the first three is building the plan, but four is really living the plan. And the plan looks like this. Okay, a little more complicated. But... We've got an assessment phase where you look at externally what's going on, internally analysis, consolidate that with a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, we'll talk about that and how do you build critical success factors. From the envisioning side, you have the traditional mission, vision, and values. Something that we do that's a little different, we'll talk about today, is defining how you compete and, and what's your method of competition. We've learned that Defining the assumptions and documenting your assumptions is huge when it comes to defining the goals and breaking down some barriers or, oh, I didn't think of that. So we'll talk about the assumption-based planning here. Then you've got this growth matrix. We'll talk about how you're going to grow. It defines your new customers or existing customers or new products or new services that you're going to introduce. And then you have the balanced scorecard, which, again, is not a strategic plan, but it's a great tool to actually communicate and implement your plan. Uh, lately, I've heard, you know, if, if not a while ago, over 80% of the Fortune 500 use this, and we use it exclusively uh, when it comes to building strategic plans. So we're going to walk you through real quickly, again, the assessment phase, the visioning, and defining of how you build this plan. And this gets so, at your, who your customers are, who you want to target, what your capabilities are, and uh, you know what the competition looks like in the industry, and there's also a you know a, a checking process because you go through this in a logic way and build it, and it's useful to go back and look at it and say you know does this make sense what we played out? So kind and of foreseeing customer right? capabilities, competition, and checking. Yeah. So how do we get this done? Um, we've done it in as short as a two-day workshop. You basically day one, day two, and you walk through the whole thing. At the end, you have this plan that you're then going to implement. Uh, we're shying away from that uh, and trying to spread out the process. Uh, we've gone now, we've got a client that can only meet for, for two hours at a time for different reasons, and so we've had 10 two-hour sessions uh, building their plan over about two months of time. Uh, personally, I think four to six weeks uh, balancing between that two-day intense and, and two-hour meeting process is the right way to go. Uh, it can't be too long. Uh, can't be too short. Personally, again, back to four to six weeks. Uh, we've got a 30-day program that gets it built. Again, the focus is not on. Uh, let me rephrase that. It's not just a focus on building the plan, but it's about implement, implementing the plan, which is really where the value comes into play. So mm -hmm. that's the scheduling piece. Now, so as you saw in that graphic earlier, the first piece of this is is the assessment phase. And what we're doing here, what you're trying to accomplish is get your leadership team or your strategic planning team on the same page, some common understanding of what is going on in the business today. It's interesting where when we talk to most organizations, many organizations, I guess, you've got the sales team, the salesperson that knows exactly what's going on in sales. The finance lady may know exactly what's going on financially, but sales doesn't know the profitability necessarily of customers. And the finance doesn't know necessarily the top customers unless they're really driving some of that reporting. Operations may not know what's going on in new product development. There's not a clear understanding or maybe at a, at a layer three or four down as what's happening. And if you don't have a basis of, of understanding of what's going on in business in a macro sense, how can you set goals? So what we talk about, and we're going to flip through some charts here, is to build charts. Trending 
and the charting is going to tell you a story rather than just static data. So you'll look at you know the the external market, what's going on uh, in the marketplace, uh, competition, uh, regulatory, what's going on with your customers. Okay, start looking internally. This is a, a, a chart from one of our clients. Ours, the names are all wiped out, um, but as they looked at their customer growth, the revenue growth over the last three years, they didn't have a lot of customers that were growing. 50% uh, of their top customers had declined. Now, the chart is one thing. What we take out of it is, is the key point here. And so what came out of this was, geez, maybe we gotta stop looking at our top customers. They understand why our top customers were not growing. Uh, but maybe we start looking at a different tier of customer or how we're selling to that customer. So the data isn't for data analysis. The data is what's it telling us? What's, mm -hmm. what's the point here, right? And this is the one, I, Paul, I was sharing with you earlier. Um, and, I, and this gets a little complicated, but it's, just, it's a bubble chart. And we love it because it has three dimensions to it. And real quickly, this shows the growth rate, a, year, a growth rate, so a percentage growth rate here, revenue growth rate, and then across the horizontal is the gross margins of the uh, categories that this customer was selling into. And the size of the, the, the circle there is the size of revenue from that category. So distributor sales was obviously the largest followed by private label. But you'll see here, again, the takeaway was, hey, geez, distributor is not only the largest, it's really the, it's the, one of the highest gross margins in one of the highest growth categories. They may have known this somewhat intuitively, but when you put it on a map, they go, wow. In fact, now they, they had see some, it. now they can see it, right? And and right. now you're working with facts and data and not just guesses. So so this really sets first, context, and this goes, goes back to the point we were talking about before in terms of doing the assessment. You can't do a good assessment of, of where you're at if you don't do your homework. This is doing the homework, and that's part of the reason, as you were saying, Chris, why it, it, in some situations, it's good to bring people together and then have breaks between the meetings so that people can digest this information and go back and take a look at it because it really does set context, give you a real good understanding and feel for where the organization has been and what the, the contributing factors are to the success of the enterprise. Exactly. Well, it's a basis of, of decision making and thinking as we get a little later on and we All talk right. about goal setting. You know, we can go back to these charts, and again, we'll kind of refresh our memory. You know, it's 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 a it's a great valuable tool over and over again. So, that was a quick, real quick, you know, assessment. Understand the business and what's going on. Uh, again, you're going to look at you know your customers, your products, your markets, your costs, your margins. There's a lot of analysis that goes on. We just didn't want to bore you with charts and charts and charts. But the goal here in this analysis section is to understand what's going on in the business. And then as you do that external analysis and then internal analysis, you consolidate that into SWOT and critical success factors. And Paul, you're going to talk to them about what this is and how do you do it? Yeah. What's nice about the SWOT analysis is it's, it's relatively understood uh, by most people and it's, it's fairly straightforward. Really what we're trying to do here is to identify what are the strengths that the organization has to build on and what are the barriers that we need to address in moving the organization forward. Because as we're talking about uh, understanding the data from the past, the past is not the future. We're just setting context. So let's get a really good understanding of what the barriers are, what the critical issues are, what some of the threats are, and also what are our strengths what is it we're really good at? What are the capabilities and competencies that our enterprise has that will help us move into the future? That helps us to define, as we were saying before about strategy, about where to play. Are we in the correct target markets is one of the questions we can start to address once we get a better understanding of, of where we are as an organization in terms of our strengths and also what our threats are. We have a client we're working with right now, family-owned business that's done a, a terrific job of expanding and we're setting up a, a, a good-sized business. We're attempting to set up a business in Asia. And they're in a couple of countries right now. One of the things we're looking at is what are some of the threats that we face on the, and really on the cultural side because a lot of the people that we're sending over there from America don't really understand the culture. So the, one of the threats we face is 
there were some cultural barriers. So what we've done is our identify an in-country manager that will help us bring the organization forward. But the only way we got to that was to understand what some of the barriers to success were. We've identified some critical success factors here, and some of these are fairly common that we see in an organization. Um, and there's too many. Typically what we look at is three to five maximum critical success factors. And these are the factors that are absolutely critical when you think about more success as an enterprise moving forward. And certainly reducing cost, as we've identified here, building a robust lead generation system. All of these, especially as you move down and look at become a more performance-driven cult culture, need to have some definitions behind them. And for instance, you know, when we say to a lot of our companies, we go in and do our assessment, we say, what are some of the critical issues? A lot of people talk about communication, and that's just kind of a catch-all. That's just a basket. We don't really know what that means. It's communication for what purpose? What kind of communication are you talking about? And how does it affect what your organization delivers to customers? So that's just is kind of a quick snapshot of um, how to pull some of this together. And, and what's happening, and I'll, I'll jump to the next slide here, which is going to talk about visioning, but what we're doing or what you're trying to do is you do all this analysis, external and internal, and you have a lot of information. And these two uh, tools are trying to narrow down what are the key strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And and we'll do a little, you know, polling exercise. Where we'll ask, you know, everyone in the room, give me your top three strengths. And we'll end up with, you know, 15 or 18 when we're done. Then we'll go back again and say, give me your top one. We're trying to get a mm -hmm. narrowed down list of the key strengths, the key weaknesses, okay? And that even gets even narrower with the critical success factor. So when you look at your business, you go, okay, what do we got to do? I'm going back a slide here that says, look it, no matter what happens, we got to reduce our cost. We can do all the different things in the world, but our costs are out of line. If we don't reduce our cost, regardless of what happens, we're not going to be successful. Okay? We, you know, more performance driven, hold people accountable. We're not getting projects done. So these end up being kind of a core theme in the way so critical success factors that are going to be instrumental in making your business successful over the next three to five years. Okay, so that's where that fits into play. And, and so that's kind of the assessment phase. The next phase is, is visioning, okay? Establishing your mission, vision, and your values. Now, uh, I'm actually not going to go into the details of mission, vision, values. We've got very, very strong beliefs on how to create a good mission statement, a uh, good vision statement, and good value statements. But what I emphasize here is that these are, can be extremely powerful tools for an organization. Um, you know, I, I go back even to, to um, Jim Collins wrote the book, uh, Built to Last, uh, Good to Great, a few others. And he, he really defined it. He talked about the core values of the business is going to help a company survive over the long term. And that's the value piece of this. But what we've learned is that when companies do a great job at this, it's very, very impactful on the performance of the business. Okay, but mission, values, pri primarily vision also is very helpful. But what we, what we also find is that companies create a mission statement that actually sounds like a tagline. They don't put the effort into it, uh, or they put the effort in during the planning process, but then they don't live it after. If you're not going to live your mission and your vision and your values, don't do it. Don't waste your time creating these statements because it's, it's, it's a waste of time. We were, we were working with a client years ago, and we were working on the value statements, and the, the one at the top there, honesty. You know, they said, honesty is, is going to be it's one of our values. Now, I've been working with them now for a few weeks, and I said, but, but you told me just a couple of weeks ago, if somebody underpays you, that you call them up real quickly and yell at them because they, they underpaid you. But if they overpay you, you just hang on to the money because you know they're going to underpay you later. I go, is that honesty? Is that really a characteristic of honesty? Because if it is, or which it isn't, you can't put that as a value. So, you know, the, the focus on this here is if you're going to do it, let's do it right. And um, by identifying these and not living them, I mean, one of the key points is if by not living them, what, what we found with a lot of our clients that we've worked with who haven't been living them is that it produces a lot of, uh, you know, kind of a, 
uh, um, negative feelings on the part of the employees. It's 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 demotivating. It's kind of disheartening to people. And you know, Chris is talking about one of our clients. One of the things I want to share with you is that one of the techniques we've used, by the way, this whole visioning process is is really kind of interesting and very useful. And one of the techniques that we've used is to ask the executive team when we've work, worked with them and, uh, the, and the team we're working with to develop a strategic uh, planning process is to stand in the future, to essentially uh, metaphorically move into the future five, six, eight, ten years and tell us what you see. When you look around and it's a visioning exercise, um, what is it you see? What do you see the company producing? What kind of an organization does it look like to you? What are its values? How is it articulating those values? How is it showing up in the marketplace? Um, you know, what's the future that you're living into is what we're trying to get at in that visioning process. And that can be a very interesting and useful exercise. Very, very. Um, before we're going to move on to the next one, but again, is if you have any questions you'd like to ask us, uh, we've got a few here already. Uh, you can just type them into the question box and we'll get to them uh, by the end. But assumptions, we talked earlier about assumptions being something unique that we do, we think. I think more people are, are picking up on it now. But every time you, you create a goal, you make an assumption about what's going to happen to achieve that goal, usually. So, you know, revenue growth. Jeez, if, you know, we're going we're gonna to grow, you know, another $4 million. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to add, you know, four more people because the average sale is a million dollars. Well, if you actually define that and articulate that, then you can peel that assumption back and maybe find out that your average isn't your average is a million dollars, but it's because one guy does a million and a half and two other people do a half a million. So if you're going to go hire another guy that does a million and a half, you're going to do well. But if you keep trying to find the half million dollar salespeople, you're not going to achieve that goal. And we found that when people start putting the assumptions out and documenting them, a you now get good debate, okay? The market's going to be flat for three years. Um, you know, one of the industries that we consult to is the shooting sports industry. And in a political year, uh, there's a lot of turmoil. Uh, who's going to win and what's going to happen to, to, to gun ownership and gun rights? Um, you know, depending upon what you're guessing is going to happen this year, you could make a very different uh, projection for sales in your, in your business. But if you peel back those assumptions, well, why do you think, you know, Democrats are going to win and, and they're going to stop, you know, uh, you know, the sale of guns. Gun sales. You start peeling right. that back, you get good discussion. So first thing is as you build the plan, document the assumptions and debate them. Maybe not through every one of them, but the ones that you think are more contentious. contentious. The other thing that's going we to have happen a real life, we get we, in, Let me just share with you, folks. We have a real-life situation that just happened to us with one of our companies in the Midwest. We're back uh, last year. This is the company, Chris, that, that remember, they, they got a $10 million purchase order from a, right, right. a, a multi-billion dollar uh, customer, new customer. And so their expectation was that given that it was toward the end of the, the, their calendar year, end of their fiscal year, they got a $10 million order. The expectation was that it would be double the order of the following year because this new customer was a multi-billion dollar entity. What they didn't look at in terms of assumptions, and that was the assumption they worked off of, what they didn't do was to identify what the pull-through system was. What was the sales system? How were they compensating their people to give us some idea of how this product would move through their system? And so now as a result, this company is still sitting on a pretty close to the $10 million order that they brought in. And this year, where we staffed up, our client company staffed up to um, produce additional product, now we're facing a downturn because we worked off of an assumption that we didn't necessarily bet. So document your assumptions, and then when you come to review the goals, you'll actually look at the assumptions to figure out why some of the goals may not have been achieved. You made right. the wrong assumption. This is what's key. So yep. let's talk now about discipline of market leaders, uh, a concept that Tracy and Wormer uh, created, which we love, and I think a lot of strategic planners are adopting, which talks about how you compete. And it talks about being great at one of these and good at the other two. So again, we've all heard you can't be everything to everybody, but the question is, what are you going to focus on? And this basically focuses on three options. You can be a product leader, you can be customer intimate, or operationally excellent. But the point is you need to be great at one and good at the other two. And the exercise we do 
is we'll we'll sit around the team, define what each of these are, define how the company might be applying all of them, and then ask each each team member to prioritize which one should be first, second, or third. And you know we don't get beyond the third person going around the table where we've got three different answers or at least two different answers. And think about it, if someone thinks the company needs to compete by being a product leader, well, their focus should be on product innovation and the product innovation process. If someone's operational excellence, you know, that's actually, that's, that's lean manufacturing and low cost or, or lower cost producer. That's very different skill set, org structure, uh, and even culture than a product leader would be. So, and this ends up really defining help you define uh, the types of goals you should get, should, should set. In fact, this is the, the actual uh, sample of what we go through where we ask the team to prioritize, here's the three options, prioritize them, weight their importance, define how you think you're performing today, and these numbers are averages that we've done now after consolidating the team's numbers. What do you think the winning score needs to be out of 100? And therefore, what's the gap? And you do this weighted gap, which is a math of the gap between uh, the weighted score times the gap. What this is saying in this organization is that 70% of their focus, and therefore 70% of their goals, should be focused on becoming more operationally excellent. Again, a great, great tool that helps define at a big picture where do you focus your, your resources and your goals and what does the company need to do to be successful? Paul talked earlier about choices. This is one of the tools to help you get there. The next piece of this now is going to say you start getting into the goal setting. And the question is, all right, we, we, we're going to talk about a goal. You may have set the goal of $4 million or it might be coming up. But the question is, where's that revenue going to come from? Where's the growth and profits going to come from? And again, a simple two by two matrix. If you look at the, the ways to grow, there's actually six ways to grow. You can raise your prices, which is, pro, which is revenue growth. You can merge and acquire companies, which has a, a lower than 40% success rate I've been hearing now. Or you penetrate your existing market, you find new customers or new markets for your existing products or services. Quadrant three is you use your existing customers and introduce new products or services. Or four, you do both, diversification. The question is, where's your growth coming from? Okay, and so we another tool we have clients do is take that revenue growth goal, let's say $4 million, and define where it's going to come from. In this case, they said 60% was market penetration, 30% development, and 10% product development, nothing in the diversification. For those new into strategic planning, you probably should have zero in that piece anyways in diversification. And then basically put the dollar value behind it. So we talk about uh, when you build your plans to actually be able to have like an elevator pitch. We're going to grow $4 million, of which 60% is going to be by penetrating our existing clients. We're going to get some new customers, maybe 30% of the time, and a small piece in product development. But it sets a, a framework for where the growth is going to come from. And it actually great, brings great insight as to how to get it. And helps you identify the activities where you're going to focus your energy. And that's a great exercise. Can you imagine taking your team through that exercise to have them identify where where they see the growth coming from? It's a terrific exercise. Brings up a lot of great This discussion. is our sorry, Paul. This is our um, our station interruption to remind us to keep the big picture in mind. Okay, again, we're getting into some of the details of minutia, but the big picture again back to the themes of aligning your, your team, uh, having a process, and helping you make choices, okay? So we're into now kind of the final piece of this, which is, okay, we, we have to establish goals. Now, we could do a whole hour webinar on how do you set goals. We're not going to do that. We're going to talk about you've now gone to establish these goals and how is a good structure to do it. This is called a strategy map. Again, it's actually an extension of the balanced scorecard that Nolan Norton created. And the way it works is this. You establish your financial goals, and then to achieve your financial goals, what do you have to do for or with your customer? Um, and then from the customer perspective, what, what do you have to do internally on the process side to achieve your customer goals, to achieve your financial goals? 
And then what do we have to do for training and development on our people, with our people, to improve the process, to achieve the customer goals, to achieve the financial goals? That's the hierarchy. And when you build this out, it looks something like this. So again, we've gone through the exercise of setting the goals. A goal is going to grow net income 8%. Now, some of these goals don't have numbers on them um, or actually owners, but behind the scenes they do. I've just shortened it so you can read it. So how are we going to grow net income? We're going to sell higher margin products. How are we gonna, and we're also going to reduce operating costs from a process perspective. We're also going to build more customer intimate uh, developed products. To do that, we have to teach customer intimacy training so that we can build the customer intimate products, sell higher margin products, and grow net income over 8%. So this is the, the strategy map, and what we like about it is you still got the goals. It's in these four perspectives, but it's a great way you can communicate this to the large organization without getting into something you'll see a little later, a little more complex and technical. So that's And you'll notice goals. that we're talking here about, excuse me, about net income and revenues, et cetera, and gross margin. And one of the things to be cautious about is that we don't get into a, a essentially a cost structure of planning exclusively. Because it cost, talking about cost is very comfortable for a lot of people. So cost-based thinking can drive a lot of strategic plans. And it's really comfortable to talk about that because we know that's what we as a company control. It's the revenue side that we don't control. But a lot of strategic planning is certainly about what's the revenue and what's the cost required to achieve that revenue. They certainly go hand in hand. But cost-based thinking, if that's what we focus on, again, because we're very comfortable with it, that can really uh, slow down a lot of strategic planning and a lot of strategic thinking and can slow down organizational, organizational growth. Well, it's somewhat where the balance scorecard came from. There was too much focus on financial goals, and we need to balance it with customer process and people, and there are other, some other perspectives, right. but that's where that came from. Now, mm -hmm. after you establish goals, you need to measure how you're doing. We're, we're very uh, big proponents of the dashboard and, again, charting. You start building these charts to see how well you're performing. You'll also link those goals to individual goals, uh, and you can link them to incentives. In fact, the framework now that we'll show you is this balanced scorecard framework. And again, we're kind of we're really going through this real quick, but you may have an uh, objective. Here's that measure or key performance indicator to, to show you how well you're achieving it. It has a target. So in this case here, there was $5.4 million or 3,000, 3 million pounds actually, of expanding customer base internationally. Peter was responsible for it. And, you know, he was expanding customer base internationally. And what we created here, this is the uh, milestone calendar. And so you'll see every month or so, there was a specific milestone that needed to be achieved. This is how now we're implementing the plan. So we started here with we needed to have a scorecard for the top three customers to know how we're doing. Um, my window's blocked here, but there's some other um, milestones that are that are driven to, to be achieved. And what you'll see now as we go into the review process is we start color coding how well you're achieving the goal. So the green obviously is on target. The yellow is a little behind, and red is we're not there. And so by looking at this framework, so now we're into kind of the, the, the design of the strategic plan, the execution of the plan, and a process to review it. We'll use this tool to review progress, but it's not at the detailed levels, it's at the macro milestone level. So this is a now great communication kind of that last tool. part. All right, great communication. Phenomenal tool, communication between that, right. between that and the, and the strategy map, you know, uh, this is the big picture that you present, and this is what you manage internally. So we're, uh, we've got about eight, nine minutes left here, and I've got some questions coming through, so I want to save some time for that. So let's just, let's just review. Um, four phases. Uh, assess where you are. Envision where you want to go. Define where you're going. And now review. Okay, and again, this is the, the details of it that we went through. Here's your assessment. We talked about the mission, vision, values. You saw the how we compete. That was the product leadership, operational excellence, customer intimacy. Defining your assumptions. This is, again, we call the growth matrix. Where is that revenue growth going to come from? 
and then the strategy map. And so we're now into, and then you'll see the milestone calendar gets into kind of the fourth phase, which is to the review process. And are you on track? So um, I actually have, an, we have another poll we're going to ask. Uh, so it's a test to see what you've learned today. Yeah, that's really not a test. <laughs> um, but the question is kind of what will be your challenge uh, going forward in building a strategic plan? You know, we had a lot today that said they already had a plan, so it was learning more. Uh, but, you know, what have, what have we gained? And for those that needed to help, uh, that needed some insights on how to build it, where are we now? Okay. Where's the, what's, what's needed now to help you be successful? That's what we're trying to drive today is how can you build this plan and, and outperform your competition? So if you click on that, we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll show that. And those of you also, entering into this process for the first time, one of the things we want to underscore is that nothing works right for the first time. So you'll go through this process, and as we said before, strategic uh, planning is a little bit of a, despite you know the engineering twist that we try to put on it, it's a little bit of a fuzzy discipline, and it doesn't it doesn't feel perfect. In fact, if your strategic planning process doesn't make you uncomfortable, then you're probably not doing it right, because some of the things that you want to do is to show where some of the the, the perhaps the leaps are that you should be making the areas that you need to get into, that you have to develop some additional skills and competencies or stretch yourself for. Okay. And those of you who have uh, used it, you know that it helps you to manage manage your enterprise in a very different way. So I'm going to close this up and show everybody the results. And what you'll see is the biggest challenge going forward is going to be gaining expertise to build it ourselves. So interesting Paul, the first time we had 50% of the, the the listeners said, you know, we have a plan, just need to get it better. Now it's down to 17%, and I'm assuming that they're gaining some expertise in order to build it themselves or improve upon upon themselves. But you'll see 25 and 25 half of people are a make it a priority, and b they need need some help building it. Anything you want to say on that, Paul? Well, I, it's a, just we're we're willing to help you out in terms of you know figuring out what you need to do, and part of the reason for doing this, of course, was to you know kind of you know share with you some of our our our, our expertise, our history, but also to give you some tools. So some of the things that we have here, just in terms of this map, this is terrific, and you can you'll be getting this. This is available to you, and so you'll have some additional information that you can use to help you build your your um, your strategic plan. And again, we underscore the strategic plan is not a comfortable process. It's a little bit kind of a fuzzy discipline, as I said before. And also the, the most critical piece is execution and really giving yourself the opportunity to get some feedback to figure out a way to measure how you're moving along that strategic plan because you're not going to be able to accomplish necessarily everything you've laid out. So getting that feedback helps you determine what, how you should shift in direction in real time. So I've got uh, we got some questions, Paul. So I'm going to go through some of these and then and then wrap it up mm -hmm. in less than five minutes. Uh, Somewhat okay. relates to what you were just saying. One of the questions was, how do you know if you have a good plan? How do you know if you have a good plan? You want to answer that? Well, from my perspective, it's it's if it's working. And what I mean by working, there's a couple of different ways that we measure the success of the strategic plan. And you know, we talked before about kind of the themes, some of the themes of, you know, of, this, uh, of this webinar. We talk a lot about alignment, of getting people focused. And, and you know, so to, when you go through your enterprise, do people have a pretty good understanding of, of why they're doing what they're doing? We often use an inverted triangle to show that there's a whole series of activities in every organization that are occurring. Are they headed in the same direction? And... So that can determine if you have a, 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 a good plan, is if people have a general understanding. They don't need to walk in lockstep necessarily, but they have a general understanding of what it is they're trying to create. And that you can see that there's a clear path to making decisions to choose through some of the options so that people know who to target and who not to target and what products or services to sell and, what, uh, and, and, and where they should be focusing their energy and time. And I'll add. And to by that, the way, whether whether or not you're making any money. 
Well, I, you, you, I think what you're getting at is, is are, you, are they achieving the goals? If you're achieving mm. the goals that you establish, assuming they're good goals, which is the first thing, but are you achieving the goals that you want, right. uh, then that plan should be working. Uh, ideally, your, 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 your profits are up, your revenue growth is up, uh, and you're less stressed as an owner or as a team member. Um, you know, that's what we look for as a good plan. You know, you call it, is it working, but is it delivering the results? When we've polled, right. you know, clients and non-clients that have plans and asked them what percentage of their goals are they achieving, you know, those that quote unquote, don't have a formal process, you know, they're in the 60, 70 percent range, maybe those that have a good planning process are over 85 percent in terms of what they're what they're accomplishing each year. Um, another question. Um, uh, how do you how do you get the data if you don't have it? Um, um, this goes back a little early in the presentation, so I'm assuming it's back to the yeah. analysis phase. Um, so every time we've gone in and and built a plan and did the analysis phase, the data was not there at the beginning, and and so you don't want to spend too much time creating data or you know creating databases. So we we obviously take what we have, which by the way is a, is a big indicator. If you cannot get sales by customer, by product or service, or, or sales by geography, by customer, some basic reporting or profitability reporting, you know, at mm -hmm. least at the gross margin level, you know, that's a big piece in itself. I'm, I'm going to throw, you know, improve reporting on the, the goal setting piece, but All right. um, we'll, we'll use what we have and then start building um, data collection procedures to get the data we don't have because you're going to want you're going to want to know what it is especially if it's a uh, customer profitability or product profitability which is usually weak um, being being kind at most of the the private companies that we've uh, we've we've met with um, and that's a great right. question one of the clients we have is in the or in the process of helping them choose some different software because the software will provide, they, they were looking at what they're currently using. It's not giving them the information they need to manage the business on a go forward basis because it's grown so much. They've outstripped the capabilities of the software that they're using. So we're helping them make a decision about what are the critical issues, what are the critical, um, what's the critical data that they need to move the organization forward and which software is going to help them get that. So let's wrap this up now. There's a few more questions and I'll actually send some emails back individually to those okay. that uh, we haven't been able to get to. What do we want you to, to gain out of today, right? Okay, companies that plan are outperforming their competitors. We don't have uh, listeners, Paul, that don't find it useful. I guess they're the ones that didn't show up for the webinar. So, but if you if you plan, you're going to outperform your competitors. It is an alignment exercise. We talk about aligning your team, but you know it's going to help you balance the goals that you want to achieve and the resources that you have. Uh, we didn't hit a lot about first timers t making it simple, but yeah, let's not get overly complex the first time out, which is why we kind of call it an articulation uh, exercise, strategy articulation. It's a process, okay? Um, this engineer is not going to get out from this process, process, process. Mm -hmm. And then the execution, this planning is a hallucination, is imperative. I mean, we focus so much on the implementation of the plan and help and execute the plan more than we do the plan itself because it's about execution. So focus on that execution. Anything you want to add, Paul, before I show him the last slide? Well, at the bottom, we, we, we talk about, we say a company without a strategy is willing to try anything. So again, what the strategy does, you said at the beginning, is it's help you determine where you want to focus the limited resources that you have. We do not have unlimited resources in any, in any company in the world. We have a limited set of resources. Where do we want to dedicate those resources? Where, as the saying goes, will we get the best bang for the buck? That's something we need to think through to make some decisions about before we make those kinds of commitments of resources. So, so we'll answer any questions, as we're saying here in the last slide. Answer any questions, as Chris is saying, he'll get, we'll get back to some of you with some emails. And if there's others that come up after, you know, give us a call. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you, you know, what to do, how to do it. And if you need help, you know, we can help you. We will. Um, we'll help you decide if, if you need a, um, a facilitator or not. And if you don't like us, we can point you in a direction. But we obviously, we do have our own, we call it our strategy articulation workshop, where we can actually walk you through this in basically less than 30 days and have a plan and really focus on implementation. So, 
I encourage you to um, give us a call. And uh, thank you very much for your time. It's time now, Paul. So thank you, to everybody. And uh, well, this will be recorded. You will get an email showing where it is if you want to see it again and again and again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, folks. Thanks very much.